Yes, hello, and we are back uh, in Luxembourg, and uh, I am here with uh, kids who also participated at the project uh, Living and Working in Space. And uh, this here is uh, a class uh, from uh, Steinfurt, and uh, they were a very productive class. Uh, they, they designed not only a Mars station, but they also designed a space hotel and uh, with fa fantastic machinery in it and, uh, and fitness rooms, and uh, they made films about uh, rovers that discovered uh, uh, Mars and uh, they also uh, made uh, instructive uh, films where they talked about this rover mission that will land uh, in uh, November and an impressive uh, stop-motion film about our solar system and uh, with an astronaut who uh, will, uh, will meet an extraterrestrial. So what was the, what's the idea, idea behind, uh, behind these films? Uh, Bilal. Äh, Doma, da wollte mir alles, Doma, da wollte mir alles wissen äh, und Menschen weitergehen, was man in der letzten Woche gelehrt hatten. Äh, an dem Film geht es darum, dass ein Astronaut äh, auf ein Asteroidland an einem Außerirdischen äh, über das Space Mining äh, informiert. So uh, they had uh, had a film where uh, where they want to, to inform about uh, space mining. That's uh, an, an they want to also inform about our solar system, about uh, all the planets. So uh, uh, I have Ryan here. Um, what is uh, if you could work one day into space exploration? What would be your preferred domain? Also, wo gehst du am liebsten, welches schaffen? Also, ich gehe am liebsten am Bereich Architekt schaffen, weil also ich kann mir gut vorstellen, Lappes auf dem Mars zu bauen, weil du nach Kinnabs gebaut hast. Ich gebe noch viel Fleisch und dann kann meine Kreativität frei laufen. So uh, she wants to work as an architect uh, on Mars because there's one uh, big advantage on Mars. So there's a lot of space and you can, uh, can build big things and you can let your creativity uh, flow. So I, I hand over now to uh, Brian Cox. Thank you. We're now going to talk about um, asteroid discovery and telescopes, some of the big projects that are in the pipeline. But I wanted to start with Matt, actually, because I think asteroid discovery is one of the few parts of professional astronomy that amateurs can really contribute to. Well, yeah, it's not only that they can contribute to it, it's absolutely vital that they do, because the thing is you have the big sky surveys like Penn Stars and Catalina Sky Survey and the Neowise up in space, and they discover thousands of asteroids, and they can't stop and go back and have a look every time they find an unusual one that needs to be followed up. So there's a network of amateur astronomers throughout the world who do the follow-up observations, and when I say amateur, I better qualify that because the level of accuracy they work at is incredible. For instance, um, they're measuring asteroids to within one arc second. And just to make that clear what that means, that is the width of a credit card at 300 meters edge on. I mean, that's accurate precise yeah. measurements. We, we mean amateur in the sense they don't get paid rather exactly. than... Exactly, <laughs> do it for life. Yeah. But, uh, and also they're measuring incredibly faint objects. Some of these objects are 20th magnitude, which is the equivalent of looking at a candle held up in Spain from Luxembourg. So I'm in absolute awe of these people. Yeah. And quite understandably, the professional community hold them in very high esteem. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, Alan, we, uh, Matt mentioned pan stars there. Mm -hmm. So could you just give us a quick survey of the projects that are out there at the moment? Sure, well, we, uh, as we've seen already uh, in this broadcast on Asteroid Day, and as Matt was mentioning, we've got, uh, at the moment, we've got Catalina uh, Sky Survey, we've got the Pan Star Survey, and we've got the Atlas Sky Survey all on sky right now either tracking known uh, near-Earth objects because the moon is, is near full, so the sky is quite bright, or trying to find new objects. And I'm mean, going to give you an example. So if we go back to the beginning of the month, June the 4th, the Atlas uh, project found a small moving dot of light, uh, pretty faint, in, in near the Milky Way, actually. Um, within 48 hours, 15 other observatories had fo followed up that object. Uh, amateur astronomers, university observatories and so on, and even some professional observatories. And within 48 hours, we knew that was a new potentially hazardous object, which is now known as 2018 LK. It can actually pass within 
the distance of the moon from Earth, so clearly it's something we need to keep an eye on. But at the same time, that initial process of measuring and following up this object allowed its orbit to be calculated, and within the uncertainties, it looks like it's not going to come near our planet for the next 100 years. So it's not our problem, maybe not our children's problem, but something our grandchildren or our great-grandchildren will need to keep, keep a track on. And that process is going on. 24 hours a day, every day of the year. So uh, every day, on average, over the month, another four or five new near-Earth objects are found. And do we have full sky coverage now? We don't at the moment, no, unfortunately, um, because it, there's a lot of sky up there and it takes time to get across it. Though. Even the fastest surveys only cover the, the whole sky once every two of the four days. Uh, the, the most sensitive surveys we have at the moment, which are Catalina and Pan stars take a couple of weeks to scan the whole sky and that's still a problem for us because we can be looking in one part of the sky when another thing is approaching in the other direction and we won't be seeing it, sensitive to it at, the, at this moment in time. Which brings us to the LSST, um, a future project but greatly enhancing our capability. Yeah, I feel like uh, LSST is, is walking in the footsteps of all these great projects that are operating now and so what we want to do is take this the next order of magnitude and, and, and really try to catalog as many of these asteroids as we can to get as close to complete sample as, as we can. So to give you an idea of what LSST will be able to do, it will cover the entire visible sky roughly every three days and every night we will detect something between one or two million asteroids. So most of these early on, the first couple of snapshots are going to be new as we begin discovering them, they're going to be repeat observations, so we're going to be able to study how fast they spin, what are they made of, what is their shape. Um, and in terms of things like the, the near-Earth asteroids, the, the ones that are potentially hazardous to Earth, we're going to take that sample of a couple of thousand that we have now and turn it into something like 40,000. So it's going to truly be the next step and, and we're working on it. Yeah. And this becomes a, a data challenge. On this. I mean, I work at the Large Hadron Collider, so we know about large amounts of data, but it takes a long time to go through it. But in this case, it seems to me, there's a lot of data and you need to do it quite quickly. Yeah, this is a, this is a in large part, a computational challenge, because what you are doing is you are taking these observations of an asteroid here, maybe it's here, and then it's here at some later point, and then you're, you are calculating where is it going to be in the future, and how well do we know where it is going to be in the future because it is that uncertainty that means that we don't initially know for sure whether or not something is going to hit Earth. And as you take more observations, you can eventually narrow that down, but that's a whole process. And with this large number of observations being taken per night, and the LSST telescope in particular has a very enormous field of view. And that means there's an enormous number, that it's going to detect an enormous number of asteroids. And the processing of that is something that we're already beginning to work on uh, addressing right now. And it requires um, a, um, a, a computing architecture which is, uh, you know, which is in the cloud. So, so think of you know, the, the types of services that are provided by Google or Amazon or things like that. It's that scale of computation. So this is the, uh, pronounce it right, the Synthetic Tracking and Data Linkages Project that you work on. What's the acronym for that? Uh, we have no acronym because I hate acronyms. I, I, I was at NASA long enough to know that I don't like acronyms. So um, what that is is actually a, a, a promising new technology for the next step beyond LSST. Now the idea here is to use smaller telescopes and more of them scattered around the solar system to track uh, the asteroids that are too small to be uh, completely tracked by even something as large as LSST. And the idea is to use smaller telescopes with extremely powerful onboard image processing to allow these smaller telescopes to take longer exposures and yet still track and discover the asteroids within the field of view. And uh, it's a it's a technology that we uh, believe works, and we have uh, uh, built a, some ground-based ground versions of it, and uh, we've even done a small test in space. Um, what, what our friends at uh, Google allowed us to do was to take one of their current satellites in orbit today, which is meant for mapping the ground, 
and turn it around on the back side of the earth when it was dark and it wasn't observing uh, the ground. And we pointed it at a number of areas where we knew an asteroid to be, but, was, but we knew to be too dim for this telescope to see. And then we were able to take that data, send it down to the ground, and run it through our, our data processing system and show that it could recover these asteroids out of the noise. And so we have a, we have a pretty high confidence that this is going to work. And then just in terms of future projects, so Mark, there's a project NeoCam. Right, so NeoCam is the near Earth object camera. It's an infrared telescope, and it has the advantage of being able to see asteroids in a wavelength that the human eye can't detect, and that is emissions of the heat from the asteroid. And it does this in two wavelengths, so essentially, it gets a heat color which tells you what the temperature is and what the size, from that you can infer the size. Um, and, and NeoCam will be placed um, in uh, space between the Earth and the Sun, close to the Earth, about four lunar distances at a Lagrange point, L1, and it will stare at the Earth and the space around the Earth. It also has the advantage that Earth-based systems don't have in that it can look not directly towards the sun or close to the sun, but in the direction um, closer to the sun that would be in the daytime sky from Earth. So it's much more powerful um, for detecting asteroids. Now, we have this asteroid day declaration, 100x, 100 times de declaration. The only way we're going to accomplish that is by having at least uh, one space-based telescope, but preferably more. I don't think we'll get there unless we have more than one space-based telescope. So the goal is to build a, we, we've talked about it before, but a, a three-dimensional, I suppose four-dimensional in a sense, a map of the solar system that we can evolve into the future uh, as well to be able to track all these objects. Well, how many objects are we speaking about? You always, when you, whenever you ask the question how many asteroids there are, you always have to specify above what size yes. because yes. asteroids come in a whole range of sizes from tiny, you know, sand grain size all the way up to you know, multi-kilometer size asteroids. So if you ask the question, how many are larger, large enough so that if they hit the Earth, they, were, they would be large enough to cause damage on the ground. That, that size range is in the range of about 40 meters or so, um, perhaps a little more, perhaps a little less, depends upon the particular asteroid. But if you ask this, how many of those are capable of causing you know, enormous damage on the ground, you're probably looking at about a million or more near-Earth asteroids. And those asteroids that cross the orbit of the yes, Earth? That and come therefore close to Earth. And how many of those do we have catalogued? And are um, watching? A little less than 2%. Yeah, we, 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 at the moment we've got uh, about 18,500 on the books of all sizes going down to objects smaller than that. So as you can see, if you compare 18,500 to millions, uh, we've got a long way to go yet. And these are, these are all difficult to discover, so we, we prioritize. Right? The first goal was to try to find everything larger than a kilometer. Now we're trying to find everything larger than about 130, 140 meters. And then the next step is going to be tr let's try to find everything yeah. bigger so than it, a It's not as dire as it so. sounds that we don't yep. know where all, they all are because we know where the largest ones are which are obviously the ones that could cause the most damage. And as Mario said, we're working our way down, finding more and more of them as we go to smaller and smaller sizes. Uh, but we've started with large ones, which was the right way to go. But uh, as Ed was saying, it's not just a matter of finding them and, and calculating all, but first of all, every time you do that, there is an uncertainty. So you need to have continuous tracking of them to make more of the measurements to refine that orbit and have a better idea in the future of where it's going and this is a kind of a long-term program. Is it, we're focusing on um, threats here. Is there mm. science in this as well in the distribution of asteroids knowing where they are and how they're moving? Oh absolutely in fact it was the realization that we didn't understand initially say 15 years ago how asteroids got from the main asteroid belt into near Earth space that led to, to the discovery of these weak but subtle thermal forces, the heating up, it turns out the heating up of asteroids on the day side can actually move them very slowly in their orbits and this is actually one of the primary mechanisms by which objects get out of the main asteroid belt into near Earth space. And then if we really want to know where an object is in near Earth space because it's actually closer to the Sun than the asteroids in the asteroid belt, uh, again we need to uh, track that slow motion, although to be honest it, it's, the, it's the close passes uh, of those asteroids to uh, Earth and Venus in particular that, that can affect their orbits.
We haven't actually talked about, maybe might you comment, we haven't talked about the size range actually, it seems to me, in the, in, on the panels anyway. So, so what, what, what is there out there? How do you characterise this population of asteroids? Well, I mean, as I said earlier, as, uh, as, as it said that there's hundreds and trillions and trillions of objects from the size of a pea and upwards. Um, at what point do you, I mean, Brian May, of course, is an expert in, in solar system dust. At what point do you say it's dust and it's an asteroid? I mean, I've always found that, you know, humans tend to like categorizing things, but you've got dust becoming small asteroids. There's a population of asteroids called the Centaurs and the Democloids that are kind of half comet, half asteroid, and maybe things aren't as. Does that yeah, that's an asteroid. I mean, I know it's not anymore, but it's on the ground. I, mean, so I don't want to get into that. If that were in space, yeah. is that big yeah, enough to be called an asteroid? Well, well yeah. there's, I mean, you, you know, humans do like to categorize, yeah. but when you have a continuous distribution of something, and in this case it's a size distribution, and a lot of times they're broken pieces of things that wow. were bigger, you have to decide where to draw the line. And the uh, IAU, the International Astronomical Union, um, has made a definition, and I think it's uh, uh, one meter. Yeah, I think I, above I, I, one I, I, meter, it's a, called an I asteroid. It's a dust there. Yeah. 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 So that's not an asteroid. If you can wrap your arms around it, it's a rock. If, it's, if you can't, it's an asteroid. Yeah, if it were still in space, it would be called a meteoroid. Yeah. Yes, of course, yes. It's on the ground, isn't it? That makes it meteorite, doesn't it? That's right. There we are. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank you, everybody. Okay. Um, I think we're going to, where are we going now? Joseph. Is it Joseph? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, and we are back with another uh, educational uh, science project uh, in, uh, in the big project, uh, Living and Working in Space. And I'm here with Noemi and uh, Thiago, and they are from the Maison Relais in uh, Heiderscheid. And uh, they, uh, they founded, together with their colleagues, a children's spaceflight community. And uh, with this community, they built a, a spaceship, a children's spaceship, and uh, they played in the space spaceship they played a theater play and a film so um, and this uh, cockpit of the spacecraft looks a little bit like the ones we know from uh, the Star Trek films and their main topic is uh, asteroid mining so Noemi where did you fly with the spaceship also Noemi wo sind ihr mit eurem Schiff dahin geflogen wir sind an der Weltraum geflogen und haben nur dem seltenen Kristallkumpulus gesicht so they flew into the, the in space and they looked for uh, a rare earth metal compolus or uh, planet uh, the planet that's an asteroid uh, that's uh, that's an asteroid uh, comp called compolus so uh, and so uh, you you come now from Heiderscheid. Heiderscheid is uh, up north uh, in the country, so it's uh, um, quite far away for Luxembourgish uh, uh, dimensions. Uh, you were, um, traveled for one hour. Could you imagine that people would in the uh, future travel for for much longer time, for months? Also, can you imagine that that the college might be there meant on the Weltall flying? Ja, weil wir hatten ein neues ähm, Raumschiff, hatten wir ein Lasergame, wir hatten ein Fußballsterrain und ein, ein Restaurant. Okay, so they had, uh, they had, they thought about laser games and football fields in their spaceship. So I, uh, I pass it now on uh, over to Sabinche. Thank you so much, Joseph, and thank you to all the kids and children sharing their knowledge. Um, I think it's time for us to fly all the way over to Chile, because we're now um, joined by, hi, Milarca Valenzuela. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So tell us what's been happening, what exciting things have been happening in uh, Chile today? Well, Feliz Dia del Asteroide, first of all. Thank you very much. We have a lot uh, of people in the live cast here in Chile. Mm -hmm. So, well, uh, in the name of the regional coordinator of all the activities, that it's the Millennium Institute of, of Astrophysics, um, I want to say that it, we will have 20, 20 activities that start this Monday and with that exhibition of meteorite. Mm -hmm. So we are the ones that collect the asteroid where they fell here in the 
in the Atacama Desert here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, this exhibition will be until tomorrow, and we will have uh, talks in all the, the country with many universities, many observatory, observatories. And so it will be plenty of activities to join this asteroid day. Well, thank you so much, Milarka, and thank you for your engagement, and keep, keep on with the good work. Have a great day. Yeah. Good luck. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so I'm from Chile. We now go to Germany, where I'm joined by Dr. Albert Falke. Thank you for joining us, Albert. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. So let us know what's happening in Germany today. Oh, it's quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, our asteroid week already started a couple of uh, days before. Mm -hmm. uh, manifold activities have been organized here in Germany. Um, for instance, some public lectures in Constance and also in Diedorf or Berlin. And uh, um, at these positions, uh, locations, um, people had a chance to prepare, um, to prepare uh, mm -hmm. telescopes and uh, uh, use it for live asteroid research. Okay. Um, the Planetarium Stuttgart, for instance, uh, gives possibility of a lecture specific to an asteroid impact in the past at Kimgao. Mm -hmm. uh, then asteroid movies are being screened and critically analyzed uh, to identify science and fictive uh, elements. Mm -hmm. uh, this will be done in Heidelberg and Darmstadt, for instance. And furthermore, uh, at the Technical University in Darmstadt, in the ESA fly eye system is mm -hmm. going to be set in order to serve but asteroids uh, will be explained and demonstrated over there. And finally, uh, uh, there will be also today events uh, in uh, the Sternwarte Turk, uh, which the whole family and with hands on experience uh, on uh, identifying asteroids on telescopic photo plates and also the opportunity for a night sky uh, of asteroids as we that's from my side, Germany, uh, what's going on here. And um, I have uh, part of Astro Day this year and see what's uh, happening uh, somewhere else on the US. Thank you so much, and thank you for all the efforts that Germany are doing. It sounds like you've really got a lot on your plate. Thank you for your support. And before I hand over to Lisa, I just want to sort of do a call out also to all of you watching to reach out to you for also your support. We've been listening to a lot of renowned experts and astronauts, astronomers, and, and also soon policymakers. And it's important that, you know, for Astro Day to be able to continue to also get, get support so we can keep on educating and raising awareness. So please do consider um, supporting Astro Day by donating at astroday.org or support your local astronomy club or or why not the department at your university or your local teacher? So please do that. Reach out. And from that, I reach out to Lisa.